We're going to talk about something that's been kind of brewing in me for a long, long time, just to give you a stark contrast between what you just saw up here and what pure grace is. Mixed grace, I told you, was an oxymoron. You cannot have mixed grace. If you got anything to do with it, it is not grace. I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, there was, a, and I've told this story before, there was a, a dad was in the, in the kitchen and his, his boys were in there watching a movie and every once in a while there was profanity in the movie. And the dad said, we're not going to watch that movie, there's profanity in it. But dad, it's a good movie, it's just got a little bit of profanity. He said, so, okay, okay, I'm going to make you guys some brownies, okay? So we made him some brownies. He brought them in there. He said, uh, here's you some brownies, boy. Thanks, Dad. This is great. But I need to tell you something. Something happened, and a little bit of dog poop got dropped into the batter. <laughs> it wasn't but just a little bit of dog poop. The rest of it's okay. Okay, Dad, you made your point. <laughs> That's what mixed grace is. It ruins grace at all. There's no such thing as grace. Grace, undeserved favor of God, unmerited favor of God. My favorite is grace is what God does for you. If he does not do it for you, then it is not grace. You cannot mix grace. Uh, and I've said this, and a lot of people think I'm crazy when I say this because you don't hear many people say this. God did not create us to live for him. Religion, that's all they talk about, is it not? You, you were created to worship God, obey God, serve God, do good deeds for God. That's why God created you bull feathers. Don't think I'm blasphemous. Bull feathers. How many of you in here have kids? How many of you have grandkids? Okay. When, when y'all had those kids, did you say, listen, you know, it'd be nice to have somebody to cut the grass, keep the house up, clean the house, paint when we needed painting. Let's have some kids. If, in my case, you'd be extremely disappointed if that's what you had kids for. I didn't have kids to serve me or to do. I had kids because I wanted, I wanted to be involved in their life. I wanted something that was a part of me. God wanted something that was a part of him. And that's you and me. And he knows we can't do without it. We've had some, I understand we had some power outages here lately. When you have a power outage, do you usually go through the house and you'll flip on the switch and you'll forget it. And you're just used to flipping on the switch and nothing happens. Well, see, that's kind of the way it is we're trying to live the Christian life without power. You keep flipping switches, but nothing ever happens. Let's just say God just decided to say, I'm just done. And he just quit supplying us with air and breath and heartbeats and everything. What would happen to us? Just like the power goes out, there would be nothing. But we think, well, we're doing this. My heart's beating on its own. And I'm doing this, and I'm, I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm, we just take so much for granted. In him, we live and move and have our being, and without him, we have no life at all. You see, religion is man's attempt to gain God's favor by keeping the rules. Obedience is what God desires. That's religion. But you see, Jesus is God's attempt to gain our favor by keeping the rules, what? For us. Could we keep the rules? No. no. That's why the law was. Listen to me. That's why God gave the law to begin with. So it would say, Lord, we can't keep these. He said, I know. I'll keep them for you. Do you want me to? That's the good news. The good news is that Jesus will do it for you if you'll only let him. How many of you 
were wore out trying to keep the rules. And everybody's rules are different, are they not? Wanda has a big problem about a part in the shack, and you don't want to miss Wayne here. Wayne is the guy who, they re-edited that book four times. Four times the shack. He helped Paul Young rewrite that book four times. They had four different endings. And, and, in that, and in that book, Mac is talking to Jesus and says something about Christian. Jesus said, I'm not a Christian. One has always had a problem with that, that Jesus has said he wasn't a Christian. The point that he's trying to make in the book is, if I were to ask you what a Christian is, I'd have a hundred and something different responses. A Christian is somebody who doesn't drink, cuss, smoke, or chew, or go with girls to do. A Christian is somebody that keeps all the rules. A, key, a Christian is somebody who is good and kind. A Christian is... You would have a thousand different interpretations of what a Christian is. But if, when you mention Christian, it goes back to religion. A person without Jesus is trying to act like Jesus. It is an absolute impossibility. It cannot be done. And that's why people get tired. That's why Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It will wear you out trying to be like Jesus when you don't have it in you to do it. That's mixed grace. This is what a thought grace used to be. I'm going to do everything that God's strength gives me to do because he's gifted me and I don't want to bother him. So I'm going to do as much as I can do. And if my resources end up here, grace is where God kicks in and does the rest. That's what I thought grace was. It took me a long, it wore me out. It just slapped, wore me out. To the extent that three or four times, I, I, just, I just wanted to quit. Because here I'm, t and I'm trying to tell people the good news and it's killing me. What is good news about that? And so, you see, all God wants from us is trust. I used to say three steps to spiritual maturity. Obedience, obedience, obedience. That's not true. All God wants is trust, trust, trust. Because if you trust him, you will obey him. But you can obey him without trusting him. Believe me, I did it for years. I didn't trust God. I thought if I didn't do what he said, he'd get me. That's not trusting him. But I was obedient to a fault. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And all it did was wear me out. You see, in religion, your motivation is fear. I had, <laughs> heard one time that they had a revival service. A lady back in, at the back had a baby, and it cried. The ushers went back there and told her to take the baby out because if somebody didn't get saved that night because of that baby, then the blood would be on her hands. That's not, uh, that's blasphemous. That's not mixed grace. Religion, I, I'm going to show you a list of 20 things that, in here in just a minute about what mixed grace versus pure grace really is all about. You see, in, with following Jesus, with Jesus being your life, love is your motivation, not fear. You remember Jesus up here, he says, okay, Kat, this is not going to work here. And she said, well, well, take it. Jesus will not take it. He will never force himself upon you. You get to do what you want to do. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. This is how when your filter gets changed and you understand what God is doing in your life and who he is and he's living through you. My old filter, before I really mind of Christ jumped into me, John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Now, this is the way I used to read that. If I obey his command, then he will love me. No, that's not what he's saying at all. If you love me. Now, Jesus said, if you love me. For Jesus to love you, what do you have to do first? You just, you just have to let him, let him love you. You don't have to do anything for it. You just have to let him, right? Doesn't that require trust? Because doesn't open arms leave the heart exposed? Don't you have to trust him? You can't let him love you if you don't trust him. 
If you trust him, you're not going to have a problem obeying. If you love me, if you trust me, you will obey what I command. That's what it's saying. Religion has turned that around and said, if you love me, you'll keep what I command you. In other words, you keep the commands and Jesus will love you. Do you see how religion mixes that in there to control and manipulate you? To keep you straight? You know why? Because that's the only message they have to get you to keep coming is guilt and fear. Guilt and fear. That's all it is. And it, it just wears you out. It doesn't work. 1 John 4.10 This is love. Not that we loved God. For years I read that commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And I, I was trying really hard to do that. But you can't give away what you never got. You can't give love if you've never been loved. Do you understand that? God wants to love you so bad he can taste it. But we just don't let him. And I run into people, oh, I know God loves me, bull feathers. If I knew God loved you, it would be washing me away with it. If you really knew that. But we don't really know that. We know it may be here intellectually, but we haven't really experienced it because there is a freedom in that that just allows you to be who you are without pretenses, without hypocrisy, without wearing masks in the church. That you have to be something that people want you to be rather than who God created you to be. So you can't love unless he first loves us and he won't force that love on you. Love will never, love is a person, he will never force it all on him. You've heard that old saying, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You heard that before? Well, let me tell you something. He is Lord of all. He might not be in your life, but he's still Lord of all. And we're not talking about obedience and all that stuff. I'd rather say more accurately, he is life, and without him, you have no life at all. 1 John 5, 12 says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. We have turned that, what mixed grace and religion has turned that into is you make it, I hear it all the time. Listen, the fields are wide under there. The people have been in church all their lives. And they don't understand this. They don't understand it. They don't understand it at all. He that has the Son has life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. It has nothing to do with what you do. Either Jesus is your life or you don't have any. Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. In him. If he pulled away, we were nothing. Now, and then in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Jesus says, those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Is that a hyperbole? No, he absolutely means that. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Say that out loud with me. Nothing. You can do nothing. This is Jesus right here saying this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered in a pile to be burned. Okay. Okay. I bought, a, bought an electric chainsaw because I didn't want to fool with all the mixing the stuff. And so I bought an electric chainsaw back last summer. And I've tried, we, we got a lot of around the shed out there. We've, got, we've been cutting down trees. Well, a lot of them have fallen and you get it mixed up in the branches. And I spent more time putting, getting the chain off back on than I did cutting trees. And then Wanda bought me a sawzall, a sawzall. What do you call that officially? Oh, oh, huh? Reciprocate. I knew that man would know right there, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Reciprocating saw, which Sawzall's found better than Sawzall. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> It'll cut a tree that big. You just 
It don't ever chain doesn't come off. It's just wonderful. We have cut down, cleared out that place. We've got all those branches. This is one thing I've noticed. That tree can be live and well. The two days after you cut it down out there, it's just as brown as it can be. It just dies because it's cut off from life. The minute you cut it off, it's dead. It may look green for a little while, which is what we are, but we're going to die. It's going to be worthless. And what do you do with it? I'm waiting till it gets cold enough to throw them in my fire pit. <laughs> it's not quite cold enough to throw it in the fire pit yet, but I'm waiting for it. It's getting close. Six degrees last night, pretty close. You know what it is? It's funny. You build a fire pit and you wait for that perfect temperature. It's got to be, can't be too cold or it might be too hot, you know. In other words, you're just too lazy to go out there and build fires. <laughs> Let's just be honest there. Okay. But see, that's what happens to branches. If you don't abide in the vine where the sap of life comes up. And you know, we don't, we don't produce fruit. We bear fruit. Here's the branches. Here's the vine. This is Jesus. Here we are. The sap of his life comes out. He produces the fruit. We are fruit hangers. We display his fruit of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and kindness and meekness and self-control. We just hang his life and it displays to the world. That's what we are. We don't produce a thing. He is the vine that produces a life. We just hang the fruit. Now, I'm going to give you the key to under, understanding everything in life. The key to under, understanding everything in the Bible. The absolute key. And that's all we'll ever talk about from here. There is nothing else to really talk about. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. Don't analyze that. What does that mean? You don't live anymore. You don't live anymore. Listen, you need to understand this. You were dead before you got saved. You're dead after you get saved. Think about it. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, right? After Jesus became our life, we were crucified with him and the old man is dead in us. We're dead in this old Adamic life and alive in Jesus, but you're dead either way. You're either dead in sin or you're dead in Christ. One or the other. And, and you see, this is why it's the key. Listen to me, this is why it's the key. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about how hard it would be to crucify yourself? No. I've had people say, I'm just trying to die to self. I'm just trying to die to self. You're already dead. That's why the Bible says, reckon ye therefore yourselves dead indeed in the sin. You already are. But that thing, religion keeps telling you, you're not dead enough. You just need to die. You just need to die. Let Jesus, you just need to die. People just try, keep trying to crucify. Think about it. Okay, let's, let's, let's do it this way. Okay. Okay, I've got this one up here. Okay, now I'm going to put my feet up there. Uh-oh. I can't crucify myself. I am crucified with Christ, and I don't live anymore. Christ lives in me. You say, Kenny, you're just going crazy. Why? I'm going to show you why. This is what I get with people. And I want to say this right off the bat before I get to it. There are a lot of things doctrinally that we can't jump up and down on and say, you're wrong and I'm right. There's not a whole lot of things you can do that. There's talk about gifts. We talk about predestination versus free will, Arminianism, reformism, and all the, all the different things. 
you, you just can't jump up and down and say, this is right and you're wrong and all this stuff. But I can tell you one thing that I can tell you 100%, 100% is absolutely true. You can't lose your salvation once you've got it. It is impossible or you never had it. And I used to say, well, I guess that's just your opinion. No. It's absolutely... If, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creation. What happened to the old things? Old things have passed away. Jesus has become your life. You know, I used to use this illustration. Yeah, but I can turn my back on Jesus. You know, I can do that. I can turn my back on Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If you don't understand Galatians 2.20, you think you can. Would Jesus ever turn his back on his father? Never. Never. And that's who you are. And you know what I get? The answer is, well, I'm not Jesus. I said, well, then you ain't saved. Because salvation is not making a decision for Jesus and then trying to get your flesh to act like it because the flesh is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. You're trying to get something that's the antithesis of God to act like Jesus. How's that working for you? It ain't working. It's not going to work. It's just not. That's why churches are empty today. People get enough of that hassle out there. You can't threaten people today who hadn't been to church with you going to hell. They don't really care. They don't believe in the God that you've taught. A God is out to get you because you're not living good enough. Out there in the world, they have to live up to standards that they can't live up to. And they come into church and they're trying to get them to live up to standards they can't live up to. And we wonder why the pews are empty. We're not telling them the good news. We're not telling them that Jesus wants to do everything for you. And in the meantime, we'll give you everything your hearts desire. You're just looking in all the wrong places. And you won't surrender and let him do it for you. Because that's the antithesis of what culture teaches us. You see, if Jesus is not, if Jesus is not your life, then you're not even saved. He that has the Son has life. This is eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has a Son has life. If you don't have a Son, you don't have life. But the wrath of God abides on you. The wrath of God abides on you, because, not because he's mad at you. It's because you've chosen to go that way, and whatever goes that way has the wrath of God on it. That's what sin is, is living independently apart from God. The most religious people of Jesus' day, he called brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. And those were the people, oh, they're the most righteous people of all. Both feathers, they weren't. Everything they did was self-oriented, eye-centered, which is the middle letter in sin. You don't have to be a serial killer. You can be holy and holy, not holy in Christ, but holy, self-righteous. And the world thinks you're just wonderful. You're not wonderful at all because you don't have any life in you. That's why he called them whitewashed tombs. All pretty on the outside, but full of decay and dead men's bones on the inside. We were created for this purpose. To live in absolute dependence upon God for everything. And to live in intimate relationship with him. Living and loving life together with the Lord. Enjoying life. You see, Jesus could do nothing on his own. Listen to me really carefully. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Now here's Jesus living totally dependent upon his Father, and he is God's son because if he did anything in independently apart from his father it would be what starts with an s ends with an n has an i in the middle sin sin so you think well you know just a little sin a little dog poop 
I want to get. I want. I want you to look at this because this this should get you so excited. You ought to just be jumping up and down. John fourteen, verse one. Jesus said, "Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you." I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, come on, Lord. We don't know where you're going, so how in the world can we know the way? Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not bulking up and saying, it's my way or the highway, guys. That's not what he's saying. He is the only one that can make a way to the Father. He was the only provision of God to do away with our sins and give us life. He is the only one. He's not being egotistical here. The world thinks he's being egotistical. Oh, there's many ways to God. Bull feathers. There is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. I am the way. If you really knew me, that word know is gnosko, experiential knowledge. Experiential knowledge. We might know about stuff, but until you go through stuff, you don't know stuff. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can't say I know what it's like to lose a child. I can't say I know how that feels. I don't know. I know how it's like to lose a mother. But I don't know how it's like to have a terminal disease. I don't know what it's like. I can know about that. But you don't know until you experience it. That word know is the same know that Adam knew Eve and she bore him a son. We're talking about that kind of intimacy. No. Intimate knowledge. And he says, if you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. (laughs) Seen him? We see you, Jesus. We don't see your father. And Philip says, show us the father. That'll be good. That'd be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even as I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, brother. It is the Father living in me who is doing the work. I'm not doing it. It's my Father doing it. You see that? What did Jesus come to do? Show us how we missed out on the way life was supposed to have been lived if Adam and Eve had done what they were supposed to do. That's what Jesus came to show us. You remember the little bird story? The guy had a big storm in the winter. The storm and the, and the birds were coming in this big glass window, bumping up against the window because they wanted to get inside. And the snow was pouring, and he, and he wanted to help them some way. And so he went outside and threw crumbs on the floor, trying to lead them into the barn, and they just kept bumping into the window. He said, if there was some way I could become one of them, and I would fly and lead them into the barn. Then it dawned on him that that's what Jesus came. Jesus slipped into the womb of a teenage girl, was born into this world to show us the way we were designed to live from the creation, to show us the way. And this is how it is. He said, believe me when I say I'm in the Father and Father of me. At least believe the, on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. And he will do even greater than these because I'm going to the Father. 
Did you hear that? You see, they thought Jesus was doing it. What did Jesus say? It's not me. It's my Father. When Jesus becomes your life and you go out and let him live, he will live his life through you doing stuff. People will see you, but you know it's not really you. It's Jesus. You say, well, what do I have to do for that? Nothing. 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 If you try to do anything for that, nothing. You're not going to get anything. It does not work. He has to do everything for you or it's mixed grace. It don't work at all. Okay. I'm going to jump down here to my stuff because I'm, I'm running late here. I'm talking too much. Okay. I want to tell you that when you try to do for God what he wants to do for you, it's called flesh. Flesh is sense and reason apart from dependence upon the Holy Spirit. It's me trying to emulate God, which is an impossibility. It's flesh. And the reason the flesh wants to do that is so it can brag and feel good about itself. That's it. It's prideful. That's why we measure ourselves among it. Well, you know, it's cold outside, and I'm here this morning. That, might, that must count something more with God than those people who stayed covered up in bed this morning. See, that's, you know, the measuring stuff. That's what the flesh likes. It likes all that stuff. But here, I want to I go down the list. It's going to be stark contrast here. Mixed grace versus pure grace. What is it? Mixed grace is grace plus self-effort. You are saved. You say God saves you. You can't save yourself. But once you get it, you better work your tail off to keep it. Pure grace said it's grace alone. You're saved by grace. You're kept by grace. There's nothing else. Key words. Mixed grace. Try. Try harder. Requirement. Hunger. Struggle. Obey, wrestle, perform. It's all about you. Pure grace, believe in, rest in, yield to, surrender, safety, trust, receive. Jesus, all about Jesus. The preacher. The preacher of mixed grace drives people with the law. Look for the carrot and the stick. You know, I know you read your Bible. I read 20 chapters a day. I know that. You spent an hour in prayer. Did you witness to five people this week? No? Okay. I think you're close. If you try a little harder, I think you can make it. That's mixed grace. You're never good enough. Pure grace draws people with love. It, you look for gracious invitation to come to Jesus. What grace is, mixed grace, one of God, it's one of God's many blessings. Grace is one of God's many blessings to us. It is a very important doctrine, this doctrine of grace. That's mixed gospel, mixed grace. Pure grace says all of God's blessings are wrapped up in Jesus. All of them. I want you to listen to me. God will never give you joy without Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's people who want peace, but they don't want Jesus. You can't have peace without Jesus. No peace, no Jesus. N-O peace, N-O Jesus. K-N-O Jesus, K-N-O peace. He's a package deal. When Jesus is Lord of your life, you get the whole package. Love, joy, and peace in the whole nine yards. He does not divvy you out. It's not a, he's not a smorgasbord that you get to pick and choose what you want. I like a little peace today. Would you add a little joy to that and sprinkle it with a little meekness and self-control? You get Jesus, you got it all. Why won't we do that? It's because we want the stove. Pure and simple. We want the stove. And God has to take us through a lot of stuff to get us a place where it's, we realize we're just wore out and it's futile. I want to spend my dying breath 
letting people know they don't have to spend 60 years in fruitless, exhaustion-ridden efforts to try to act like Jesus. They don't have to do that. They can just relax and just trust Jesus to do what he wants to do. Anyway, faith is, in faith, the mixed grace is trying to influence God. We're trying to influence God with our faith. Lord, I'm really believing you for this. I'm really believing you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm really believing you about this. Pure grace is trusting God for what he said and done. Trusting him. Just pure and simple. Trusting him. You know, it, it, Jesus said, if, if you've got faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can move them out. Mustard seeds like dust. And so he, he, religion is saying, if you've got more faith, it, it, more happens. Well, Jesus was just totally wrong. He said, if you had a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. So well, it's not how much faith you got. It's how reliable what you're putting your faith in. If you're putting, if I built an airplane, one of those glider things, and we're up on a 5,000 foot cliff, and you get, I say, this, this thing's going to fly us down. And I built it. You could have all the faith in your world. We're going to crash and burn, buddy. I'm just, I don't care how much faith you get. Or you can get on a jumbo jet, and you can be scared to life and not scared to life or scared to death and not believe it will, it's going to crash and burn. It will pick you up and take you because that jet is a lot more reliable than my airplane. Faith is not the amount of faith you have. It's the reliability of the object you're putting it in. Don't talk to God about your mountain. Tell your mountain about your God. That's the way it works. Repentance, mixed grace, is turning from sin. You remember we used to talk about repentance. You're going in one direction, and repentance is turning away from an action. You're turning away from sin. It's usually accompanied with guilt and sorrow. Pure grace is turning to God often with joy. Changing your unbelieving mind. The root word of repentance is thought or think. Re means back or different way. Repentance, true repentance, begins in your heart and your mind. Because if you don't think any different, you won't act any different. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he the way you think you are. Whatever you think you are, you are. Confession is reviewing your sins in mixed grace. Review. Oh my God, I did this. And, and, oh my goodness, I need to confess this. Pure grace is agreeing with God. Confess in the Greek is homologeo. It means word or say, homo the same. Say the same thing God's saying. This is not the right direction. God, I agree with you. That's, that's what confession really is. I agree with you. You're right and I'm wrong. Forgiveness is maintained through repentance and confession. That's why most Baptist churches, the carpets wore down at the aisle. Because every week they're not righteous enough, they're going to come back and tell God how sorry they are, and they're going to try to do better this week. And the more people you have down here to do that, the more you are preaching the word, brother. Bless God you got them told today, brother. God bless you. You know, tell them about it, brother. You know, the altar was full today. God bless you. You're, you're, you're dangling a carrot that they'll never be able to reach. And, I, and, and God really got hot about the Pharisees who did that. Obedience is, you no. Know, with pure grace, it's a done deal. Jesus has forgiven us all. Listen to me very carefully. Very carefully listen to me. If your salvation is based on your performance and who you are, okay? Every time you act independently apart from God, you need to go back and ask forgiveness. If that's the case, then you're trying to act like Jesus. Jesus is not your life. Let me ask you, does Jesus 
need forgiveness? Ever needed forgiveness? Ever will need forgiveness? Is totally, purely, unconditionally loved by his father? Will never be separated from his father? Is all that true? If Jesus is your life, do you need forgiveness? See, we've been here so long, we still do. We, it's kind of hard for us to say, ain't it? Because we've been steeped in it for so long. It's hard for us to say we don't need forgiveness. We've already been forgiven. You can't act forgiven if you don't really deep down believe that you are. Do we still sin? Yes, we still sin. But that does not alter the fact. Listen to me. This is the most important part of the message. Listen to me. Hebrews 10, 14. By one sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice, He has made perfect forever those of us who are being made holy. Listen to me. Lord Jesus, open our hearts and minds to hear this. This is the key. When Jesus became your life, your eternal life became Jesus in the Spirit. Let's say that he draws a line here. Down below the line, you have a soul. A mind, will, and emotion. When you got saved and Jesus became your life, he made you perfect forever. What does that mean? That means perfect, complete, lacking nothing. No need for forgiveness. He's, he is everything you need. He has wiped away your old life, given you his life, so that now your past, present, and future is his life. The things that's bothering you in the past, not there anymore. Okay? Listen to me very carefully. Below the line, your, your soul has not been redeemed yet. It hadn't been redeemed yet. And there's a reason. God wants it that way. Why would God want it that way? Because you can't have faith without a soul below the line. So listen to me really carefully. If God redeemed our soul the same way that he redeemed, redeemed our spirit, we would see everything as God sees it, right? Wouldn't we? You could have no faith that way because Jesus sees everything. And faith is the evidence of things hoped for, or the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things what? Not seen. That's why we see through a glass darkly. Our soul is the darkly. We're trying to see what's been made perfect through this soul. That you cannot have faith if our soul had been redeemed. Do you understand that? That's why we get a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's why you got a choice. Yeah, you're going to fail. You're going to struggle. But it's already been covered. We're just trying to get our soul in line with what's really happened to us. That's the struggle. It's not that God's disappointing you. It's just part of our faith of learning dependence upon him we run out of resources down here and we say lord i can't handle this he said oh my goodness that is wonderful news now i'll do it for you and we think oh i'm such a disappointment oh god i just i wish i could have done it god said i knew you couldn't now i'll do it for you do you want me to and more we it's just wonderful now it's every minute when stuff aggravates me, I say, Jesus, he said, okay, I got that, I got this. I've been doing this a long time. I have to do this every minute of every day or I'll get distracted. Every day. I mean, I find myself doing it every day. If I don't, I can just feel kind of the life sucking out of me because I get distracted by so many things. I lose focus so easy. I say, Lord, I'm getting distracted here, and I have to focus on the now. Listen, time and eternity is set, intersect right now, right now. That's why Jesus said, I am is my name, not I was or I will be. I am. 
If you focus on this now, right now, that's where you find Jesus. The past is gone. He did away with it. I can't get my hands on tomorrow. It's just right here. The things that stresses us out of what happened yesterday and what might happen tomorrow, Jesus said, you can't worry about that. I'll take care of it right here. Do you believe me? So, all right, obedience. Mixed grace says keep all God's commands. Pure grace says you just abide in the love of Christ. I'll do it for you. Sanctification for mixed grace is a process. You're getting better. You're getting better. You just, you just got to keep on getting better. Jesus has been made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. It is a done deal in Jesus. It's a gift. It's a fruit to cultivate and to enjoy because you're already there. It's my soul. I don't need more of Jesus. I just need less of me. Be holy because mixed grace says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Well, they really get a lot of mileage out of that in religion. Oh, well, who in the heck's going to get to see the Lord then? If you're going to measure holiness by your behavior, who in the heck's going to get to see the Lord? Come on now. And people, I did it for years. They keep coming to church, listening to this junk, and keep giving money so we can tell them again next week. I, I don't understand that. And they tell this is the good news. Oh, it's like an insurance policy. I forgot to tell you that. You only get it when you die. Bull feathers. I want to get more passionate this coming year. <laughs> I'm praying for it. In Christ, pure grace, you are holy. You are righteous. The law, mixed grace, shows us how to please God. These are the things that please God. Pure grace leads us to Christ so we can just be justified by faith in Him, not in keeping the rules. Sacrifice and mixed grace is giving up stuff for the Lord. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. If that was the case, I would be the most righteous person in the world. Because when I was growing up, I wouldn't buy asthma medication on Sunday because I was making somebody work and it was displeasing the Lord. <sighs> Giving up stuff. I said, okay, Lord, I'm going into the ministry. I don't want to, but I'm going. Maybe you'll love me if I go. Then I went so long you can't play golf on Sunday because that's the only day preachers work. And you can't do that. God will send you to hell if you play golf on Sunday. I hate it. The whole PGA Tour is going to hell. I said, what do you used to think? I used to think like that. Seriously. If you could see where Je I'm helping you see where Jesus brought me from to where I am today, then you'd know the reason why I love him so. Oh, man. But in pure grace, the Lord is giving himself up for me. That's what pure grace is. I'm not sacrificing nothing for him. He's sacrificing himself for me. God's love and mixed grace is unconditional with conditions. Now, how about that? How's that? Unconditional. Yeah, God loves you unconditionally if you do this. Something wrong with that picture. Pure grace is unconditional. God loves you unconditional. I don't care how you act. Now, you can run out, run out of here and say, Kenny Ashley's going down there preaching. You can just live like hell. Go to heaven when you die. I, you can go out there and say that. But you see, you understand, understand this. Jesus is my life. How much does the Father love Jesus? As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so I have loved you. You can't live that way if you don't believe you're unconditionally loved. That's what changes people's lives. Is to know there's a hole in our heart that needs unconditional love. Because we won't trust God, we try to go get it from everybody else. We try to please people so they'll like us and we'll feel good about ourselves. That's what religion does. It put masks on people. And you can't see who they really are. It's like the guy said, I can't let you know who I really am because if you saw who I really am, you not, may not like me and that's all I got. And I'd die. The Holy Spirit's conviction in religion, it points to your badness. 
It's fault finding, it's rebuke. But in pure grace, it points to God's goodness and He leads you into light. Eternal security hinges on, in religion, your faithfulness. In pure grace, God's faithfulness. I am first and foremost in religion a servant of God. In pure grace, you're a son and daughter of God. You're a child of God. How to overcome sin in religion? You repent, confess, and try harder. Repent, confess, and try harder. Confess, confess, repent, try harder. Repeat as often as necessary. In pure grace, you reckon yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. More gets done when I, in religion, says work. In pure grace, more gets done when I rest. Now, don't misunderstand me here. When I say rest, I'm not talking about sitting on the couch and eat potato chips and watch television and let the world just, you know, let all the work. Rest is going about your daily business, trusting the results to God no matter what. I go out and do it, and hey, whatever happens, hey, this is the thing that God's wanting to do it through me, in me, for me, and ask me. And if there's a detour, it must be a reason for the detour. The message of religion, mixed grace, makes me self-conscious. The message of pure grace makes me Christ-conscious. This, uh, all this stuff it, it, that I got here on this last part is from a book called Hyper Grace by Paul Ellis. I would highly recommend it. Uh, this is the message that there's a world out there desperately needing to know. And what I have found is you know, Ben goes around doing his survey question. That's the way he gets around. He does his survey question. He'll say, I'm, I'm just running a little survey. Do you think you're a holy person? How many people do you say, yeah, I am absolutely holy? How many people do you think you get that from? None. People who go to church every Sunday religiously don't know they're holy. They're trying to be. I'm trying to be. The fields are white out there. The fields are white out there. Don't we want people to know? This is, you know, I, I, God told me this week, he said, Kenny, you, you're, you're talking like this is your message. This is mine. I was convicted of that. This is not your message. You're just the vessel to help people to let me love them to life. I want to get my hands on them so bad I can't stand it. I need somebody to help connect me with them so I can love them to life. They don't know. They don't know. Would you take me this year and let me live full and three in reckless abandon in you, through you, for you, and as you? Because there's a world out there I want to love to life. And we want to let him do that. Okay? Let's pray.